today on an all-new Dr. Phil. Luke does not allow me to have a cell phone. I'm not allowed to leave the house more than five minutes. She claims her marriage is like a prison. You put her in jail, Thank right? You. I put her in jail. I wanted her to get scared straight, for the lack of better words. He says his wife is the problem. She needs to be motivated. I wish she was smarter. You said you are a stinky, worthless human, and I have so much hate for you. I have exhausted the humble, delicate approach. Controlling husband. Did she go three days without a shower because you wouldn't permit it? No, because she chose to. Or angry wife. You threw a paper plate at him? Yes. That was a glass plate. Have you called her stupid, ugly, well, fat? I'm trying to motivate. I'm trying to really? see. This is motivational. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. I hate to see people suffering, and you've heard long enough. Stand by, Dr. Phil. Wilson, take I'm going to get you the help that you need. Five, four. This is going to be a changing day in your life. standing but i only want you to remain standing this is for the ladies if you think getting married coupling up having a committed relationship is a good and natural way to go through life if you feel that remain standing if you don't sit down all right so that's pretty much everybody i'm going to describe a man and if you hear something along the way that you would go eh, not so much then sit down. What if this person that you had consciously coupled with told you that you are a worthless, smelly, <laughs> fat, ugly, lazy woman, and I have so much hate for you? <laughs> You're so picky. <laughs> Well, it gets worse. They also say you might as well be a man because you look like one. Now, what if the person saying those cruel things to you was your very own husband, your newlywed husband of just over a year? Well, that's exactly what my first guest, Shara, says she is facing. Now, there's two sides to this, and you're going to hear his in a minute. But she says her husband is a mean, insecure, know-it-all, and because of him, she cannot leave home, she cannot get a job, she cannot have friends, own a cell phone, or even wear a robe in her own house. She says things are so bad she feels like a prisoner. Take a look at her point of view. My husband, Luke, is very controlling, very condescending. He manages everything that I do, every move that I make. My marriage is definitely a prison. I don't have a phone because I'm not allowed to have a phone. Luke does not allow me to have a cell phone. He doesn't allow me to talk to my friends. I'm not allowed to leave the house more than five minutes. I can't open my laptop without him asking me questions. He said, if you want to look better, don't paint your face, go to the gym. Honey, don't sit there and eat all the chips like that. Have some uh, carrots or something. Luke tells me when I'm allowed to take a shower. I remember going three days without a shower. When I was employed, he would come to work with me every day, sit there in the lobby and wait for me to get done working, and I ended up losing my job. My husband gives me his sleep medication at night, so I won't get up in the middle of the night without him knowing. Luke thinks he is the man, that he is smarter than anyone in the room. He's called me dumb, stupid, lazy, ugly, worthless. Luke has taken my pride, my dignity, my self-worth. I can't be emotionally drained every day. I can't go on in a marriage and fight every single day with him. Well, her husband, Luke, actually says, hey, I'm street smart, well-educated, and able to see things from all angles. He says his wife is like a child who, frankly, needs his guidance. My wife, Shar, is very stubborn and set in her ways. I'm not being picky. You are. No, I'm telling you, take what you can get to make ends meet. Oh, my God. She definitely needs guidance. She needs to be motivated. I feel that it is my job, my responsibility as a husband, to step in and say, we need to get focused. I wish she was smarter. 
I wish she had the street smarts. I wish I didn't have to keep kind of like picking up after a child. Almost on a daily basis, I have to remind her it's cold outside, put some socks and shoes on, dress appropriately to the weather. Things that I should not be telling a 33-year-old woman. Every time I bring up an issue that needs to be addressed, she takes it as an attack. You know what? I don't you're have a you're a right now. No, you're getting pissed off because it's the truth. I'm getting pissed off it's because true. look at you walking away right now. She feels like I'm being condescending. When I tell her she needs structure in her life, she just gets furious. My wife and I talk about divorce almost on a daily basis. I cannot seem to get through to her. I can be delicate. I can be abrasive. I have simply run out of ideas. Wow. Um, is what she's saying accurate? Uh, no. Do you have to give her permission to shower? No, I do not. That's not true. Okay, now, hold, hold on. We need to tell the truth here. I'm going to ask you again. Does he give you permission to shower? Has he told, did you go three days, as you said on the tape, waiting for him to say it's okay to shower? Yes. Okay, is that true or is that false? One well, of you's lying. You said well, no, see, she said you know, yes. I try, I try, what I try to do is I try to get her to take better care of herself. I try to teach her the self-respect, that hygiene, Diet is very important, and to wake up every day. Are you going to answer my question or just well, make well, a Fourth of July <laughs> speech? <laughs> well, I, I encourage her. I encourage her to take care of herself. Does she have to get your permission to take a shower? No, she doesn't need my. Did permission. you? Did she go three days without a shower because you wouldn't permit it? No, because she chose to. That's not true. Okay. It's it's it's, it's true because she would prefer to lay around and be on the internet for most of the day. Okay, are you sleep telling the truth noon. here? Yes, sir, I am. Well, so he's not. Correct. Okay, we're about done here. Are, are, are you telling the truth or are you lying? Somebody's lying, I don't talk to liars. Okay, well, I am so not lying. When she chooses lying. to sleep till noon and not motivate herself, get cleaned up, wake up in a reasonable time frame in the morning, that that is her choice. There's a yes or no answer here, and I'm not getting it. Do you tell her she can't leave the house? No, I encourage her to get up and come and at least She go says shopping. that you tell her she can't leave the house alone for more than five minutes unless escorted by you. No, that is very untrue. I encourage her to get motivated, at least do shopping for herself. Did you tell her she can't have her own cell phone? It's not feasible for us to have phones, two smartphones, because they're very expensive for one, and... Do you have a keystroke monitor where you can track everything? No, I saying? do not. I do not have a keystroke. I don't even know how to do this. Did you tell her you did? Yes, I did. I told her, I said, yes, I have a keystroke app on there, so be careful on what you say. I'm defending myself. I'm trying to keep... Okay. I'm trying to guard my personal life because she likes to share it with everybody and their brother, what's going on between us. Yeah. Well, you don't need to do that anymore because you're on national television. <laughs> uh, that cat's out of the bag. <laughs> Have you called her stupid, ugly, well, fat? I'm trying to motivate. I'm trying to really? say shut this up. Is, this is motivational. And later, you threw a paper plate at him? Yes. Was it a heavy paper plate? Nope. That was a glass plate. Put it out there. Did you and tell her she can't get a job? No, I encourage her to get a job. Matter of fact, I encourage her. Seriously, I, is it just me? No. Uh, when she did have a job, did you go sit in the lobby while she was at work? When she had her job full time, I was, uh, I was very proud of her. She worked hard. And I had a diabetic coma episode. I ended up in the hospital. And at that point... Is this coming to a yes? Yes, this is coming to a yes because she wanted me to come up to her work to keep an eye on me and ask her boss if it was okay if he sat in the lobby so he... Okay. I, the one time. Well, what you told us is that he came and sat in your lobby every day while you were working until you got fired. Correct. How often did you go to her job? Well, I was going every day to her job and oh. sitting in the lobby just because of the simple fact she can keep an eye on me. She knows what to do in the event 
of giving me either whether it be an insulin injection. Did somebody okay. write stupid on my forehead? No, no. <laughs> but it's the insecurities, you know, I mean, we're leaving a big part of this out. It's the insecurities of, as my husband, she thought I was running around <clears> seeing <throat> other women, so it f makes her feel more secure when I'm, I'm in a line I'm, of sight. I'm sorry, I, I'm not gonna listen to that lie. Well, it's, it's, it's true. Why was he in the lobby? The one time he did say I would feel comfortable going to your work and I allowed that to happen the one time uh, because of a com diag Yeah, okay, but what about the other times? The other times it was, I felt personally that you came to work with me to monitor everything I did, everything I, everybody I talked to. Is that true? It is, it is not true. It is not true. <laughs> this whole thing <clears throat> was, it's, it's stemming from insecurity of her wanting me by her side. You know, you tell her she can't wear a robe inside the house? Well, I mean, inside the house, you know, anything goes, we're in private. No, so that's you don't tell not her true. she can't wear. Do you tell her she must wear a tank top, shorts, or underwear to bed? Well, it's like uh, when she, I guess when you put on Carhartts or a snowmobile suit, and it's not exactly flattering if we're, if there's going to be any kind of intimacy. You, uh, you wouldn't exactly want your wife coming to bed just bundled up like she's a sleeping bag around her. And it's, it's uh, So is that a know, yes? Well, it's a yes. It's, it's a yes because I would like to see my wife, you know, be more flattering, you know, when, when I constantly have to tell her things like, well, you know, you probably should put some socks and shoes on before you go out in 20 below zero. Do you want her to go to bed when you do? And do you give her your sleep medication so she doesn't wake up she, during the night? She asked me if I could have, if she can have something to go to sleep. That's She's stressed and, she, and that is true. That is true. H have you called her stupid, ugly, well, a, fat? A lot of names, a lot of the name calling has been where I am at the end of my rope. I'm only a human being. And right. people do get into name calling when Well, it's I made a list. She, she gave us a list. She says, you okay. said you're worthless and you are nothing and I want nothing to do with you. You're such a disappointment. You do nothing to turn me on and you don't even wear what I want you to get me turned on. I have done more than you, seen more than you, been richer than you will ever be. I am smarter than you. You haven't lived life and you don't know <laughs> Nothing would be a word to describe you. You might as well be a man because you look like one. You have brought nothing but ugliness into my life. You will be on the streets with nothing. You are a fat, ugly, stinky, worthless human. You don't take care of your body and you disgust me. You are a worthless, smelly, fat, ugly, lazy woman and I have so much hate for you. Maybe I need to leave you again for you to get in the hang of being a wife and stop wasting my time. It goes on. Yeah, those that's, things that's, that's very far-fetched. I wrote down verbatim, word for word. Well, that you is know, that's, absolutely and, and the honest truth. You know, truth. that's what you like to do is capture a heated moment. But what about where because I'm trying to be problem. humble? What These about are the when names I'm trying you call me and it doesn't approach? go away. What about when I'm trying a gentle approach and humbling and bringing you breakfast in bed? One and day a your month? coffee. And one day a month, how can you say that? Because that's when we get along, is maybe one day if a I month. If I don't do the shopping, if I don't do the cooking, you don't eat. I don't want to go don't anywhere with you. you to drink water and to and get some nourishment in you. You go all day laying in bed. It's called I'm depression. Not doing anything. Do you it's blame called me? depression. I don't blame you, but I'm trying to motivate. I'm trying to really? say no. say this is this is motivational. Well, it's motivational, but this is not true. These statements, these okay. statements that I so-called made are not true would you, to that level. Would would you say that you have a um, parent-child relationship with her? Yes and no. You know, when I have to remind somebody to do just the basic hygiene or the basic... Like a parent would a child. Like, like, please don't sleep till noon. Yeah, we do used to some... say that to our children. Yeah, so yes. Would it, to answer your question, yeah. I feel like it's... <laughs> I have to, I'm having to... <laughs> I got an answer. Okay. That's yeah. great. And you've also said on many occasions, you know, I have to set my alarm to get you up in the morning. Where have you been the rest of my life when I've got my other jobs? You were never there to get me up. I know you may have done that in the past, but I would like to see some of that. I would like to see you wake up on your own, motivate, eat properly, 
and start off Well, maybe day. when I'm talked to nicely and have the ambition to want to, then it will change. I have some problems of my own, and I'm trying to stay on point, but I have, I have a problem myself. I met her in a city, in a big city, right. and I was never told, you know, she never got into her background about being from the country and growing up on a farm, and it was, I did, I, we really didn't know each other when we jumped into this. And so every day was constantly finding new things out about each other that were kind of disturbing. You said that you're savvy, street smart, educated, you, that you're just more a worldly person, right? Yeah. How come you are in such a mess? Well, I guess that's why we're here. Absolutely. Because seriously, that's why if you're, we're here, if because you're that I cannot smart, figure it out. I, you know, no, you can't. The, you're, the you're not even close. Okay. Well, good. Good. No, I, listen, I, I'm trying to help you here. Okay. You're not here. You're, you're not even close. You want this to work, though, right? Absolutely. All right, well, let's take a break. And when we come back, is Luke the only one to blame here? Look, there are two sides to the story. And he says that his wife, Shara, has such a bad temper that he's actually been forced to call 911 when things got out of hand. Uh, we'll also talk about the time Luke says Shara set him up and got him thrown in jail when we come back. Luke has gotten physical with me. He grabbed my wrist and bent my hand back. He was in so much anger and it was like looking at Satan. It scared me big time. Shara has a lot of anger problems. I do raise my fist to Luke in anger, but I have never hit him. There were several times where I felt that my safety was in jeopardy. You ball up your fist and you act like you're going to do something. When I see her balling up her fist, the scowl on her face, the shoulder movement. She threw a plate at me when I was laying in bed. The other night, she threw a plate of food at me. Food went everywhere, and luckily the dish didn't break. And if you were there, you would he would have laughed. It was a paper plate. It was not like a regular plate that you would just wham at someone. She flung it like a Frisbee and said to me, I'm done. OK, Shara says her newlywed marriage feels like a prison sentence. She says Luke calls her fat, worthless, ugly, stupid, and controls her every move. He even, she says, uses his black belt Aikido training to keep her in check. What, what are you, karate chopping her? What you... No. I am keeping myself safe from when she's clinching, balling her fist, coaxing like she's drawing back her arm, and the scowl on her face, the paraverbals, it's all, these are things that I've seen in the streets and in training where people are about to strike. So yeah. I am keeping that from happening. Yeah. Um, Oh, you have a bad temper? I do. I will admit that, yes. Um, I raise my voice. I will draw my fist back and act like I am going to defend myself, but I have never, ever hit you. Uh, that's a lie. No. That's a lie. Of course. Uh, <laughs> you, you threw a paper plate at him? Yes. It was not a paper plate. <laughs> was it one of those wax ones that, like, was it a heavy paper plate? Nope, just a really light paper plate. There was a basket underneath of it to hold the paper plate, and there was barbecue and chicken, and he had upset me, and I just whipped it at him. I mean, it's not... Chicken and all? Yeah, chicken and all. That's really interesting. That's really interesting because you know, let's get let's get it right out there. Let's do that was let's that do. was a that was a glass plate that I brought to you in bed, as I always do. I brought your dinner to bed with a silver fork. There was no paper plate or a uh, little basket as you described. That was a glass plate. Put it out there. I, put put it it out there. I must not know the difference then between a, it was a, a, glass a plate paper plate and a glass you're, plate. You're cutting on it with a knife and fork. I do all your cooking. I bring your food to the bed because you don't want to get out of the bed. Uh, wh uh, oh, Please. Why did you throw any kind of eating utensil at him? I was probably upset at something he had said to me. Very angry. 
but yet you put up with all this other stuff for a year. Why are you doing this? I don't know. I don't. I love my husband. I very. I love him very much. But yeah. this is why we're here. I need this to stop. How, how's I your, need the I secrets to stop. How, 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 how's you know, your sex been, life? Well, our sex life it's it's hit and miss. I guess with any troubled marriage, it. Uh, you know, I would like for it to, intimacy to be uh, uh, more often, but with everything going on, it's it's uh, pretty difficult to, um, you know, to to go there when. Uh, well, you've you defined know, I, this as a parent-child relationship. I mean, do you recognize that when I say it? That the way you're directing her and coaching her, encouraging her, whatever, is very parent-child. Do you see that? Yeah, I see that. I mean, think about it for a minute. You came here for help. I've been doing this for 35 years. This is not my first rodeo, and I'm, I'm seeing that you got a parent-child relationship here. It's glaring, parent-child, father-daughter relationship. And who wants to go get in bed with daddy? And I'm not saying it's all you. Uh, she, I'm sure she's not the perfect wife. Yeah. He says his wife has a vicious temper and even devised a plan to have him thrown in jail overnight for a domestic violence charge. Take a look at this. Luke and I had an altercation. He had mentioned something about finding a phone number that was in my phone. The ultimatum was, you're going to delete the phone numbers or, you know, it's over. And then the fight escalated. There was a cup of coffee sitting on the counter. Luke took his hand and backhanded the cup of coffee. She immediately ran outside. I went to the neighbors and had asked them, if you hear three knocks on the door, can you please call 911 for me? I went back inside the house and he grabbed my chin and he had so much rage and anger inside of him. I didn't know what he was going to do next. And I had knocked three times and the neighbors knew to call 911. Immediately when I heard the knock on the door, I knew it was the police. And we all know that knock. When the police showed up, I was still shaking. She said that I physically assaulted her and they arrested me for domestic violence. When we went to court, he was found not guilty. Okay. Now, y you say that she told the neighbors to call the cops if she knocked on the... Knocked on the wall. Knocked three times. Knocked three times. Yeah. That was the signal. Yeah. Um, and so you did. Yes. And so seven police officers show up. Yes. And they arrest him. Yes. Haul him off, goes to court, and he's found not guilty. Correct. How did you feel about that? Very upset, very angry, very, um, I guess in a way, sometimes I, it didn't surprise me because he's always had the mentality to manipulate <clears throat> and get his own way. Okay, but let me ask you all something. When you look at all of this kind of concentrated, the, the way we've done it here, I've made lists to kind of put all the things together in one place for efficiency's sake. We've had videotapes where you guys are talking about what happened. When you see all this compressed and condensed into a, a profile of your life and marriage, how do you feel about that? You know, there's a lot of things that need to come to light today that uh, so you want to tell more. We, we haven't touched on. You want to tell more. We haven't touched story. on some some serious. Okay, well, you give me the give me the top three. Number one is all the secret emails, her contacting people from 20 years ago. Like your ex-girlfriends? Like my ex-wife and ex-girlfriends ex from 20 years ago. Okay, number two. Um, number two, it's discussing our personal life with every person she comes in contact with. Nothing is kept sacred. Okay, number three. And number three, come out and be honest about the jealousy. I would let you explain the jealousy part. Because you say you have a lot of envy, and that leads to anger, and you 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 don't know you're not sure how First to lash out. First of all, out. I never said I was jealous of you, and I never okay. will be. My wife actually punched me, struck me. Well, I would get my money back for that black belt. <laughs> well. We were having a dispute about money issues. I started to record the situation because she was starting to get louder and louder. I knew at that point that she was out of control. Well, that's all we want to do, but right now you're going ape on me. I was very upset that he 
needed to call his mother and take him out of the situation. She's a peon. Look, I just want to get. Shows up here with a police officer. There's nothing they're gonna do. She started lashing out at me and trying to grab the phone away from me. Keep your hands off me. I haven't touched you, Luke. Yeah, you're, you're the one touching me right me. now. Get you're the, the one that grabbed my me. wrist. Get the the away from me. You're so twisted right now. I did not touch him. I did not hit him. I did not assault him. Yeah, you think I'm recording, so you're throwing yeah, yeah. some yeah. out there. He said, get away from me. I'm going to call 911. I saw on the phone that 911 was already entered into the phone, and all he had to do was sit, hit send. I'll f hit send. Stay away from me, Shara. No, what are you doing? I ended up leaving in handcuffs and being charged with domestic violence. Based on my recording, they arrested her and took her to jail. Okay, so you've each had the other hauled off. Yes. This wasn't a revenge. I just want to put this out there. This was, this was not anything like that. My wife actually punched me, struck me. She was advancing on me, and as soon as I hit send is when she immediately hit me. Well, I would get my money back for that black belt. Well, <laughs> that's the thing. I would march. Okay. I would march down there and tell them I want my damn money back. Well, that's the thing, you know, because with, with the, in this day and age with law enforcement, if you try to do any kind of martial arts or any advanced training, yeah, that's, but that's, if somebody's that's coming at you with a paper plate, I mean, no, it's not a paper plate. It wasn't a paper plate. It was a glass plate. I'll take that to my grave. I'll take the lie detector test right now. You can hook me up to, to NASA. Okay? <laughs> hook me up to the most advanced lie detector test in the world, and I will pass it. I may be the most advanced lie detector test in the okay. world. Okay, okay. And I can tell you that your capacity for insight is very low. Okay, your ability to look at yourself in a critical fashion and say, what's my ownership here? The fact that you define encouragement with derogating statements. Yes. And so when you say you are a worthless, smelly, fat, ugly, lazy woman, that I have so much hate for you that you think she'll just say, you know what? I, I'm going to answer that challenge and I am going to... Stop being worthless. I'm not going to smell so bad. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to be less ugly, exhausted, and I'm going to be more lazy. I have exhausted the humble, delicate approach till I'm blue in the face, waking her up with the breakfast in bed. Please, come on. It's time to wake up. And if that way is not working, I'm going to try another way. Oh, you try until, the abusive until, way and think it's going to work? The problem. No, it's not going to work. Well, I, I'm at the end of my rope. What I was saying... <laughs> is that your capacity for insight, your ability to step outside yourself and look back and see, how am I doing? Is that reasonable? Is this productive? Is this getting me what I want is very low. You don't have the ability to do that. You should be asking me, Dr. Phil, what can I do as a husband to inspire change in this marriage? What can I do to heal this situation? Because obviously, as smart and educated and street savvy as I am, I'm lost here. I'm losing. I, I'm losing her. I'm losing my marriage. I, I'm not happy. I, this isn't working for me. Give me some new tools, man. Give me some new tools. That's, that's what yeah. you should be doing instead of yeah, arguing back and forth about right. what kind of plate she threw at you. Yeah. Well, I, I just want, you know, there's, there's, there's secrets. There's, there's more to this that I want her to reveal you know, on my behalf, because I feel like I am, it's, it's all focused on me. Well, you know, it's, okay, it's, I, you, there are secrets. That she has secrets? She has, she has something that she needs to bring to the table. Do you know what he's talking about? I don't know what he's talking about, no, and you, I you honestly don't know. Don't know. No. You don't, do you want to know? I want to know. Do you want me to ask him? Yes. What's she talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? When I asked her why everything was a secret, she had to go behind my back and discuss our personal affairs with everybody and their brother, I said, you know, why do you do those things? Why and the do you secret lash was, out? And the secret was, well, I'm doing this because I am just frustrated. And the reason being is I just, I have this, this envy. And, and what is it she envies about you? Well, I, 
ask her. Okay. I, you know, I think it's what is it that you envy about him? And if you're going to continue to lie about this, it stops now. What stops? Our marriage. Because this right here, you need to put that truth out there. What is it that you envy about him? There is one thing about him, yes, that Which I do. Which is? Uh, his strong personality. I'm a, not a strong person. And you find that offensive? Well, I... At this point, you know, I find a lot of things offensive. You said there's a secret she needs to disclose, and that secret is that she has envy for you. She defines that as admiring that you have strength of personality. Okay, so it's out there. By God, we got it. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there. It's, it's out there, but this is what the motives were for all the emails, texting, putting me out there, destroyed the relationship with my brother. Um, this, these were things that, you know, like my brother had, didn't have anything to do with our relationship, but she still felt the need to send a message to him that she faked her pregnancy, I'm having his child, uh, he, he wishes death upon you, and these were Facebooks. I mean, we had a deal not to be on Facebook. She broke that deal a few months ago and created another Facebook page. And the, the agreement was, let's try to keep something sacred and private. Mm -hmm. And she turned to Facebook again, secretly, behind my back. Did, did you do that? Yes. Wow. <laughs> so we got something agreed upon. Yeah. So you did that. You did another Facebook page. Why did you do that if you said you weren't going to do it? Uh, I believe that this was the time that we weren't together. Oh. I was in my apartment by myself, and I had nobody to talk to. I felt that was my way of you know, at least being able to talk to someone. Yeah. She so just got out of jail. I just want to say, she just got out of jail, went and bought a cell phone, and was calling me saying, I, mm -hmm. oh, I love you so much, thank you, because I stuck up for her in court. You put She's her in jail, begging right? me. I put her in jail, but see, I, did, I wanted her to get help. I didn't want to see her incarcerated. Yeah, because that's wanted... very therapeutic to right. go to... <laughs> well... To but... put your wife in the drunk tank. That, well... That, yeah, that, that warms them right up. Well, uh, you know, if, if, if uh, she needed to get some sort of, uh, uh, I guess, scared straight, for the lack of better words, then, you know, this, this, when somebody hits you, you know, in the groin, like she did to me, and it's on the 911 recording. No, when, it's not because I never hit you. When she hit me, and yes, you did. And if you're going to continue to lie about this, it stops now. What stops? Our marriage. Because this right here... You, you, need, you need to put that truth out there. Okay, the, you know, the paper plate, the glass plate. Okay, fine, I'll let that slide because you know what? It, but at least, you, you know, when an officer has been an officer for 30 years on the she, job, a sergeant knows. By the way, are you aware that you're pointing at and lecturing? I, I just, I, just curious I'm, if I'm you sorry, were aware I'm that you were saying. Just you, with my hands. you listen to me. That's how it is all the time. But this is, this is something that we come here to be honest. And when she says she never hit me, this is, this is horrible. It's on the recording. It's on the recording. I never touched you. If you're not going to admit to oh, wait, it. Wait, 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 wait. Marriage may be over, so let's figure that out. He's saying that you hit him or need him in the groin. And you say you didn't, and he says, if you lie about that, we're done. The marriage is over. Go fill out the papers. Did, did you knee him in the groin? No, I did, did not. Did you hit him in the groin? No, I did, did not. Did you try to? No. So... <laughs> somebody's delusional. I think it's me. Uh, because I got to tell you, th this is... You know, it's, 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 Dysfunctional as this seems, it's really very fixable. Let's take a break here. Um, everybody has a history. Both of these people have a history. Have they been damaged along the way that makes them hypersensitive on this trust front? We'll talk about that when we come back. <laughs> After 29 years, I finally told my family what happened when I was five years old. I remember sitting on this man's lap. I had a dress on, 
This is hard. I'm sorry, this is hard. Luke and Shara have only known each other for two years. They've been married one. But there is one thing that may explain some of the dysfunction that this couple is experiencing. They've been very forthcoming. Take a look. After 29 years, I finally told my family what happened when I was five years old. My dad had a friend come to the house, and um, my dad's friend was sitting downstairs. <sighs> this is hard. I'm sorry, this is hard. I remember sitting on this man's lap, and my parents were nowhere around. I had a dress on. He had his, his fingers where they should not have been. I remember as soon as it happened, I felt that I was gonna get in trouble for something. This is a secret that I have held for 29 years. When I was eight or nine, I was molested. The kid in the neighborhood that did this was the bully, the tough guy. For all this time, it was just this memory in my head that uh, I never shared with anyone. I carried it around for 37 years. This is something that the two of you tragically have in common. Uh, you've both been in that situation. And let me tell you, I I've, um, worked with so many people over all the years that have, have been impacted by that kind of horrific conduct. It, they kind of go one of two ways. Either their self-esteem is, is ripped from them and they become very passive and compliant so as not to invoke uh, that kind of rage or control from someone. Yep. Or they embrace a false sense of superiority because they become what I call white knucklers. They white knuckle their world. They hang on so tight because they feel like if they ever even relax a little bit that everything will spin out of control. And you've done one and you've done the other. Let me just be very straight. The manner in which you are seeking to motivate, inspire, and change this person has the opposite effect of what you want. Correct. The good news here is neither one of you has done anything here that is irreparable to the other. You love her. Yes. If you walked around a corner at the mall or at church or somewhere, and there was somebody that had her pinned up against the wall and said, you are ugly and smelly and fat. How, how would that go over with you if some guy had her pinned against the wall derogating her in that way? It wouldn't go over too well. You wouldn't put up with it for one second, would you? No. Then why do you accept it from yourself? Both of you need to start holding yourself to a much higher standard of how you conduct yourself. You're calling the cops on each other. You're, you're, you're throwing names out there and derogating one another and getting into physical tussles and all of this. That's beneath you. Sure, it's beneath you. You are better than that. You don't believe that or you wouldn't be here. Absolutely. But you have a damaged personal truth. And people generate the results in life they think they deserve. And you are generating the results you think you deserve. Okay. And I, I want you all to do two things. I, I'm going to give you guys a book that I wrote a long time ago called Relationship Rescue. And you know that song, I Loved You Before I Met You? Mm -hmm. I, I wrote that book for you before I ever met you. I did. I mean, it, it is the Luke and, and Char book. It should have been at the front. It's dedicated to Luke and Char, who I will meet someday. Yeah. This book is, is for you. But I don't want you to just do that. 
I also want to get each of you some very specialized professional help in two phases. One, survivors of molestation. Special help with people that can talk to y'all about what the results of that can be. And then second, to help you to define a marriage and a couple where you both get what you want. And I, I'm going to hand pick this and put it together. And this is our gift to you. There's no expense to you. No, this is just something that I, I want to do for the two of you. Okay. Will you do that? Will you take that help? Absolutely. And they're, they're, they're going to be very frustrated with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because you, 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 you talk a lot. Okay. Um, <laughs> And, but just, I'm going to tell them to hang in there, because when you get past that, I think there's a good guy in there. I think you're a good egg. Okay. Deal. Okay? Deal? Thank you so much. All right. I want to thank all of my guests today, and a special thanks to our medical team at Doctor On Demand for assisting some of my team with preparation for the show. And if you at home want to have your own Doctor On Demand that you can pop up on your smartphone right away, my son Jay and I have created that app. You can go to Google Play or the App Store, download it. You don't even have to leave your house to talk to a doctor. We use it here all the time. We'll see you next time, and we will keep you posted on these guys. They have a better future than you might think. Thanks for being here, guys. Today on Dr. Phil. My daughter is dating a registered sex offender. Have you met him? Absolutely not, because it would be violent. You have a young girl. He was charged with sexual abuse. Does that concern you? No. When it happened, I did not know it was wrong. How can you assure me that he's not touching my granddaughter? Are you a victim here, or are you guilty? Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here I hate to see people suffering, and you've heard long enough. Stand by, Dr. Phil. Both of you, take We're going to get you the help that you need. Five, four, This is going to be a changing day in your life. Go, Dr. Phil. Now, I know, thank you very much. I know you've heard this before. Maybe you've even said it. My mom cannot stand my boyfriend. <laughs> well, the hate goes a whole lot deeper today and for a far more serious reason. Michelle refuses to even meet her daughter Melinda's boyfriend. She won't talk to him, can't even say his name. Why? Well, because she is dating a registered sex offender. Now, he says, look, I was just a child at the time. He hates being labeled as a sex offender. He's 26 now. He says he is living the straight and narrow. But Mom Michelle, well, she's scared because Melinda has a four-year-old daughter, and it was a young girl that he offended against. She's convinced this man is not even almost reformed. Take a look. My daughter, Melinda, is dating a registered sex offender, and I'm totally disgusted. That thing that my daughter chooses to date, I cannot refer to by name. It is true that I do refer to it as its. I honestly believe that the it is pursuing my daughter to get to my granddaughter. In my honest opinion, once a sex offender, always a sex offender. About my daughter dating a registered sex offender, I am absolutely 100% without a doubt, even if Dr. Ville tried to convince me himself that I was wrong, I am not wrong. Not wrong. Not. If you want to join our conversation today, you can tweet us at Dr. Phil hashtag boyfriend. You can do that right now and be part of this show. And trust me, I'm sure many of you will agree that Michelle has the right to be concerned. Do you feel, and we're referring to him as Jack, do, do you feel that he's trying to hurt your granddaughter? 
Absolutely. You already think this. Absolutely. Not just that he is a potential risk, you think he is an active risk. Yes. I feel he's grooming my daughter to get her so wrapped up in his b that his eye, that's all he's looking at. The end result is I'm going to have this, I'm going to have this. What's your daughter say about this? I mean, if, if her priority is her daughter and her daughter's safety, if Why does she say she's not concerned? Obviously, to me, my granddaughter is not her priority, and she's not looking out for her safety. Uh. The risk is there. How can you assure me that he's not touching my granddaughter? You can't possibly tell me that this four-year-old granddaughter of mine who sleeps with her mother or somebody seven days a week is not crawling in bed with that creep and my daughter. You, you you don't say his name. In fact, you've got a list of names for him. You call him bleep, it, scumbag, pedophile, rapist, child molester, nameless, worthless, <laughs> creep, disgusting pig. You call him that piece of <laughs> that thing you're seeing. So you have no respect, no Absolutely regard none. for this individual in any way. No. Have you met him? Absolutely not, because it would be violent. Well, Melinda says the real issue is not her boyfriend. It's her mother's absolute total need to dominate, control, and dictate every aspect of her life. Take a look. I don't feel that my boyfriend should be on the sex offender registry. He was just a kid. I have a connection with him that I feel my mom would never understand. I trust him with all my heart. I just don't get that vibe from him that he would ever harm anyone intentionally. My family keeps asking me to choose between him and them, and I keep telling them that it's everybody or nobody. I want my mom to know that I do love him, and he loves me. We're not breaking up. There's just no way. What we have here is someone that has been convicted of a felony for offending sexually against a young girl. You have a young girl. Did you think that through? Yes. And, and tell me, give me that thought process. I know he was wrong with what he did. Um, and the family, a lot of us have dealt with sexual abuse in some sort of way. Um, I just feel like he was a kid. He was experimenting, probably. Are you trivializing this? Are you minimizing this? And underreacting to it? I don't know. I'm asking. I don't think so. So why do you say this is just about control on her part? Does she not have a, a, a legitimate concern here? She does, and I completely understand where she's coming from. But she's taking a, a thing that two children did. They were at least five years apart. What I try to explain to you, developmentally, five years apart, eight and a 13-year-old, a 13-year-old certainly has a lot more experience, no matter what it is, than an eight-year-old child. OK, but it's not just about him. That's, that's not everything. It's the fact that you control everything. I have a copy of the police report here. It says the following, the, the things that he was charged with. One count of rape, one count of sexual abuse, and one count of endangering the welfare of a child. And the police report says that his offenses against this child were from the ages when she was between 8 and 11, across a four years. Not just an impulse experimenting one day, but four years. He was 13 to 16. I did the math. Those were the, those were the ages. One was prepubescent. The other was postpubescent. Now, there is a distinction there. I, I just want to be sure you understand what he was charged with, and he, and he was in jail for, what, seven months and then made a plea deal. Mm -hmm. OK? Do you get that? Yes. Does that concern you? No. Uh, when he was released, he was, he, he is a registered sex offender for life, stage two. Mm -hmm. There are three stages that these predators are categorized in. 
And stage one is that they are a low risk of reoffending. Stage two is that there is a moderate risk of reoffending. Stage three is that there is a high risk of reoffending. So he is at least a, a moderate risk, according to the categorization system, of repeat offending. It's my understanding he's stage two because of his other past of being involved in drugs and alcohol and getting in trouble. Those are risk factors. You're exactly well, right. Yeah. Because if somebody impairs their consciousness, if they impair their ability to make a decision, and they have a history of offending against others, those two things combined do make them a high risk. He's not that person anymore. Right. Well, and you, you could be right about that. I, I, you know, I don't know. But I want to meet and talk to him. I want to, I want to see what he has to say. Now, before we go to break, I want to ask the question to those tweeting today, how would you react to your daughter dating a registered sex offender who says he's reformed? Michelle has never met Melinda's boyfriend. She has never even spoken to him. And later, for the first time, she is going to meet him. She is going to hear what he has to say. But first, Melinda's sister says there's much more to this story, and she's going to join us next. We don't get help. I know I will become physically violent. I will seek out that opportunity when I know that disgusting pig is with my daughter. I will eventually violently react. A few months back, my family ganged up on me, told me how they were conspiring to get rid of my boyfriend from my life. They also had told me that I was a bad mom and they were working on ways to take my daughter away from me. I would do almost anything to get my daughter and my granddaughter away from it. That night changed my view of my family and I can't look at them the same. Well, that was Melinda. She is a single mom with a four-year-old daughter who has been dating a registered sex offender for 10 months. Her mother, Michelle, is not even almost happy about it. But Melinda's younger sister, Dawn, says their mom is just overreacting. Why, why do you say that? I feel like she doesn't give my sister the chance to just live how she wants to live, and it's her relationship, you know? And I don't approve of the nasty name she calls him. Yes, I was abused too. And she never calls my abuser a pig, a monster. And she could have totally vocalized that to the other person. Why is it always he's the nasty one, he's the monster? Do you have a double standard here? No. But are you hearing it? She's saying, I feel like there's a double standard. She has all of this passion. And, and venom against someone that might offend against her granddaughter, but doesn't seem to have that same vitriol against the person that offended against her. Right. The that, person that's that a double offended standard. against her is not in any of our lives, is not around. Mm -hmm. it, he's gone. He's out. That's false. I'm trying to get to the bottom of what's going on in this dynamic here. And people can have different opinions, but you don't have different opinions of factual occurrences. And when people lie to me, I am done. Has the person that offended against your daughter had access to her? No. And you say yes. It can't be both. I don't, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm over that. It's, Obviously, I'm, you're not over I'm it just when you're saying, openly discussing it now. You are not over it. I'm just saying it. the bigger picture is... Listen, I am so sorry that this has happened to the three of you. I, I mean that in all sincerity. That's not a new normal. You, you don't... Come on. This isn't something that you just say, well, you know, it happened to me. It was no big deal. It happened... It, that, you, that, you don't just begin to talk about that as though it's normal. I did everything that I thought was right. I thought I protected my children. I thought I did everything I needed to do to bring them into this world and provide safety and security and a safety net for them and not want history to keep freaking repeating itself. And I'll be damned right now if I'm going to let it continue on to my granddaughter. You seeing this type of individual has made me go back into therapy myself. 
Are you doing this to thumb your nose at your mother? No. Do you value your daughter? Yes, I do. Did you want your daughter? Originally, when I first found out I was pregnant, no. Are you a good mother? I feel I am a very good mother. Is she a good mother? I'm sorry, but no, I do not feel you're being a good parent by the choices I, that you continue to I want to get everything make. on the table here. You told us, and I quote, Melinda calls her daughter bitch, smacks her in the face, and is mean. Yep. She has done that. She has. True or false? I have. And your daughter is four? Mm -hmm. And well, you call her bitch? I, not to her it's face. It's not I'm saying, taking it out of context. You and are I, so smart. And I'm mom, not the mom, only one that does it. You guys say that stuff, too. It's not just me. It's like you're just, you're just being a little bitch right now. It's not like I straight up say, bitch. That's not what I'm doing. And smacking, it's more of a... That's when a she, lie. When I've she... seen you haul off and really smack her where it hurts her and she automatically screams in fit. I'm asking you to be honest with me because I am trying to help you and you need to understand that I consider myself to be what is called a mandated reporter. It means I am required by law if I see, learn of, or know about a situation where a child is being abused, neglected, in danger in any way, I am required on the clock to report that. It is a reportable offense. So I either got to do something to fix a situation, change a situation, alter it in some way, or I am mandated, required to report that. I don't and you need to, to tell me the truth, people, because I don't like what I'm hearing here, that isn't even true. a little the bit. The last thing that I want to happen is see my granddaughter lose her mother and the family that she's known for years. I didn't four ask years, you what you wanted. I asked you for the secure. truth. The truth is, is that my daughter can be at times very abusive emotionally, physically to her daughter. Then we've got a registered sex offender that you're dating. Does this person stay at your house? On the weekend. He spent the night there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Does he sleep in the bed with you? Mm -hmm. And where's Does your she daughter? sleep in the bed with you? No. They, the kids have a sleepover in the living room. Okay, let's take a break. Michelle, uh, Michelle talks to Melinda's boyfriend for the first time when we come back. I have spoken to its probation officer to express how concerned I am. Basically, what I was told by its probation department that it has lived up to all expectations within his probation. So therefore, there's nothing that they can do. At the break, you were saying to me what? That this is getting out of hand. You said this is getting out of hand for me. What do you mean? Because this, this, I, I came here to pretty much tell my mom to back off. I get that you know, well, this is getting out of hand. I just wanted you to come in here and smoke my mother off my ass so I can go do what I want to do. Yeah. But the problem, and, and I'm not saying that's not a good goal. Because she does need to back off. She is too no, controlling. I know when that she I have plans, my own issues. when she plans birthday parties and things like that, while you're at work and can't be there for your daughter, that's not good. That's that a lie. is manipulative. No. That's well, an absolute that lie. That is what you were doing. Well, you're, you're okay. It's gonna end up. Right but you notice on that. this card, I've got issue one, two, three, and four. That's number four. Time permitting, I'm going to get to you and tell you that you need to back off and let this girl run her own life. But I'm stuck on issue number one right now because I think I've got a child endangered here. And it's not just about Jack. Maybe Jack's a good guy. I don't know. I, 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 I want to talk to him. He's not here because his probation officer wouldn't let him travel. Jack says when he was 13, he was just a curious kid playing doctor, and he's not the monster Michelle thinks he is. Let's take a look at what he has to say, and then we're going to talk to him. Do not consider myself a registered sex offender. I said I want people to know me as a person, if not a label. The relative I abused was younger than me. At the age of 13, me and my victim 
We used to hang out a lot all the time. She was eight years old. She sat on my lap a few times and I actually put my hand on her leg and on her pants. She never told me to stop. I never had her touch me. Touching abuse probably went on for a couple months, but not like every day. It was probably three or four times. So one day when the relative was in counseling, she brought up the sexual abuse. She made a report saying that I have touched her. And then a year later, another report was made saying that I had sex with her that was not true. I did not do what I was accused of. I was in jail for almost seven months. My attorney told me if I didn't take a plea for 10 years of probation and register that they would send me to prison. And so I took the deal. I am not a sex offender. I did it at the age of 13, and I'm paying for it the rest of my life. And I'd like Dr. Phil to tell me that I'm not a bad person. It would mean a lot to me. Well, it would mean a lot to me if he's not a bad person. I hope that's true. We're going to find out in a minute. What's your comment on that? You heard him speak? It's first time you've heard, first time you've seen him, first time you've heard him. Yep, disgusting. I don't think an individual, it, he's obviously just minimizing what he did to his victim. It's blah, 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 blah. It's like, you're, you're a felon. People who are not guilty don't plead guilty. You said the victim was a willing participant and never tried to stop me or say no. Are you kidding me? What kind of person? Hold on, I'm not, I have 13. absolutely no problem conducting an interview. I'm gonna bring Jack up on satellite right now. We're gonna talk to Jack. Jack, Dr. Phil, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Linda's mother, Michelle, feels that you are trying to minimize and trivialize what took place and that you believe you, in fact, are not a sex offender. What I have done in the past was wrong. I have accepted what I have done. I've been to counseling for it. Um, I'm trying to take one day at a time. I would not say that what I did was her fault or my fault. It's something that happened when I was 13. And I go every day, I regret what happened. I'm not the type to hurt anybody. I don't know how much you understand about psychology, but in psychology, you go through different courses of training. And my particular course of training was in clinical psychology. I will also tell you that once I finished up my training and got my doctorate, I did a year's postdoctoral training uh, in forensic psychology. Uh, and have worked as an officer of the court to evaluate people like you, to evaluate whether someone is worthy of being around a parent or not, and to know what signs to look for in determining the sincerity of, of someone and to measure their level of insight and their likelihood of reoffending. And I am troubled by some of the things you're saying here. Don't know you, don't know, you could be the nicest guy in the world, I don't know, but what I am interested in is one of the quotes you gave to us, and it is a quote, I will read it verbatim. You said, the victim was a willing participant and never tried to stop me or say no. Are you kidding me? Now, I'm, you recall saying that to our producer? Um, I didn't, I don't believe I said those exact words. No, you know, you said those, know. the only thing I'm changing is you used her name, which I did delete from the verbatim quote. Other than that, that's what you said, that she was a willing participant and never tried to stop you. You then said, hey, this just happened a few times. It was as playing doctor, which kids it, do. No. You, no, you it didn't, wasn't you just didn't playing say those doctor. things? Did you it was say being those things? Curious. I do not remember if I said those exact words. That's bull. What kind of person? Hold on. Is not, I have 13. absolutely no problem conducting an interview. And if I do, you're the first one I'll come to. Thank you. Okay? <laughs> did you or did you not say she was a willing participant? Yes. How does that sound when you hear it read back to you? It sounds terrible, actually. I meant willing participant as in 
she was there with me. She didn't tell me to stop. She didn't see it a problem. I didn't think it was a problem when I was a child growing up. I didn't know the consequences of it. I didn't know it was wrong. The police report says this went on for four years. 13, 14, true. 15, and I'm just telling you what the police report says. That is not true at all. Okay, the police report is wrong. And I, no, I'm not saying that the police report is wrong. I'm saying I was not, that did not happen for over four years. And you know the number one thing I'm looking for is insight. Do you get it? Do you get the gravity of what took place? And if you try to minimize it or trivialize it, that tells me that you don't get the gravity of what took place. An eight-year-old child, nine-year-old child, 10-year-old child, 11-year-old child does not have the capacity to give consent. That's why they call it statutory rape when an adult has sex with a child because the child can't give consent because they don't have the mental or emotional capacity to consent. So when you say she was a willing participant, she is prepubescent, you are postpubescent, that is a huge gap. She, do you understand that she didn't have the capacity to give consent? Yes, I do understand okay, that's that. That's important for me that, to know that you understand that. Yes, I do. So the fact that she didn't stop you or she didn't run away, to blame the victim is absolutely unacceptable. You I am not blaming the victim. Okay, well, that's, I'm glad that to hear is that. Not, that is not. Okay, I, I'm glad to hear that. You cannot blame the victim. Now, you were released with conditions of probation, correct? Yes, I was. And the conditions of your probation were you were a level two sexual predator that has to register as a sex offender for life. You must maintain employment. You can't drink alcohol or do drugs. You must stay away from areas where children congregate. No contact with children under 18 unless they're in the company of at least a 21-year-old and with permission of the supervisor. No contact with your victim. You have to report to local police with the current photo every three years. You can use a computer, but you can't do social networking. You've got a 9 p.m. curfew Sunday through Thursday and 11 on Friday and Saturday. H have you maintained compliance with the conditions of your probation? Do you maintain that I curfew? Do. Yes, I do. D do you have permission from your supervisor to be around Melinda's daughter? Yes, I do. So you have written permission from your supervisor? Not written permission. I have verbal permission to come over. You, yes, need to get, you need to get that in writing because that probation officer doesn't have the authority to give you verbal permission to do that. If you don't have that in writing, they can roll up in there, yank you out of there, and violate your probation. Yes. I, I'm trying to help you. But you're saying that you're living the straight and narrow at this point, right? Yes. Okay. I'm... I, I, I got a problem. You know, it, you're wondering whether or not he is a risk. I, I don't know whether he's a risk. 43% of sex offenders go get rearrested within three years. Now, only a small percentage of those are for another sex crime, like 5.1%. And actually, only 3.5% of those that do it with a family member reoffend within that period of time. So the fact is, he's probably pretty darn low risk of offending against your granddaughter and your daughter, just based on statistics. But you are a high risk for going back to jail if you violate your probation, and you've already violated your probation because you have had not one, but two DWIs. I had one DWI since I've been on probation. My first one was well before being on probation. You realize that's a violation of your probation? Yes, it is. I did violate probation for that. And I'm trying to live my life one day at a time, and I'm trying to make the best of my life that I possibly can. Were you right to be prosecuted for this sexual offense? If I was able to go down to trial, I would have tried to do what I can to make things right. Because I did get charged as an adult when I was a child for this happening. Uh, are you a victim here or are you guilty? I'm not saying I'm a victim.
because I have made that mistake. It's been very hard to be charged as an adult for something that happened when I was a child, to live my life every day as a registered sex offender and have that over my shoulder. I know what I did was wrong. I've owned up to what I have done. I've gone to counseling. I've tried as much as I can. So you acknowledge and admit that was wrong, unacceptable, inappropriate, not okay. You get that, right? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And you're not trying to minimize that or trivialize that? No. But as I was a child when it happened, I did not know consequences. I did not know that it was wrong. What do you think about what he's saying? <laughs> I still don't hear you acknowledging that you're just portraying yourself like, oh, because of this, because of circumstance, because I was young, because I didn't know any better. You've been always five years older. Five years older. All right, let's take a break. Melinda says she has no intentions of breaking it off with her boyfriend. I'm going to tell you what I think when we come back. Michelle wrote to me because she is at her wit's end with her daughter who is dating a registered sex offender. Her daughter is at her wit's end because her mother is controlling and dominating and judgmental about not just this but everything else that she does. One of the issues I'm talking about is whether or not we as a community should be concerned if a registered sex offender moves into our neighborhood or into our building. And it's really interesting to know that sex abusers typically don't just have one victim. I will show you how many victims they typically have. Is it 10? No. 20? No. 30? No. As many as 40 victims. 70% tend to have between 1 and 9. 20% tend to have between 10 and 40. And then there are those that go beyond. These are folks that don't get caught the first time they do this, generally speaking. So the question becomes, can these people be cured of this disorder? And the answer is generally regarded in the profession to be no but they can be helped. They can be managed. There are treatments and control efforts that, that do work. Cognitive behavior therapy works, where you change their thinking. Psychoeducational therapy, which focuses on developing empathy. Pharmacology, and standard assessments, where you can tell if they're beginning to move in the wrong direction. Community notification and registry, restrictions on access. Uh, often conditions of probation say you cannot be around children without supervision. And then community integration. Jack, I want to give you the opportunity to say anything you want to say. I just want everybody to know the mistakes that I made were in my past. I'm doing what, I'm, what I can do with what I have. I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to live with that regret of what happened in everybody else's eyes trying to accuse me of doing something when I'm trying to do the right thing. You, you said you didn't know it was wrong. At, so at no time in your mind did you ever say to yourself, this is wrong. I'm not going to say that because I did feel it was wrong. You said earlier, I, I, didn't, I didn't know it was wrong. I was just a kid myself. I didn't know it was wrong. Now you say you did know it was wrong. When it happened, I did not feel, I did not know it was wrong. Okay. But did, I had a feeling, I had a feeling that it was. Did you do it in front of your parents or your other siblings or your friends? No. If you didn't know it was wrong, why did you hide it? I didn't, I didn't try to hide it. So, but you didn't do this with your parents sitting there. You didn't do it with, with any adults around. No. So you knew it was wrong.
I've always said you can't change what you don't acknowledge. And that insight, you know, the ability to step outside yourself and look at yourself, the ability to be honest with yourself about things is one of the strongest predictors of improvement. I'm looking and wanting to hear you say, you know, Dr. Phil, I, I, I didn't get it then, but I get it now. I damn sure get it now. I understand uh, what's the gravity of what took place. I understand what this did to a little girl's life that was still talking about it 10 years later in therapy. I understand that I have possibly scarred her in such a way that it will affect her sexual adjustment, her relationship to men. I've been in enough therapy that I understand that those who have been sexually molested feel devalued. They are often at high risk for promiscuity and drugs and alcohol and poor self-esteem later. I understand that I started a ball rolling that some girl is still paying for today. I get that. I am truly and deeply sorry, and I am devoting the rest of my life to making up for it in some way. That's what I'm looking to hear from you, and that's why I'm asking you those questions. Yes, I know all that, and I do understand all of that. I have accepted what I did was wrong. Still to this day, even though you supposedly had therapy, could you, you, you're just, you're, you're still weak and not being honest and really accepting responsibility. I don't think that you understand the impact that you have caused. And I don't understand, I don't think you understand the impact that you're causing this family. Well, let me ask you this. The things that I've said to you, do those bring some things into clearer focus about the position you need to take? Yes, it does. As an adult, I know and I accepted of what I did was wrong. I know it was wrong as an adult, but at the age of 13 when this happened, I did not know it was wrong. I hope that you do find it in yourself to forgive yourself for the things that you have done in the past, that you own those things, and that you dedicate your life to doing what you need to do to stay straight and do the right thing. All right, we got to take a break. Next, Melinda's father is here as well. I want to hear what he has to say when we come back. All right, well, we're back, and uh, I'm talking with Michelle, her daughter Melinda, who's dating a sex offender. Melinda's father, Robert, is here. Where do you come down on this? Are you concerned about your granddaughter? Absolutely. When I found out he was dating Melinda, I just, I lost it. You absolutely, unequivocally, must recognize that he is a higher risk individual than the general population. I do understand that. I, I don't perceive that he is in any intense therapy at this point, because uh, if he was, and it was quality, he would have been saying to me what I was saying to him, which means he is undertreated and undermanaged in this situation for me. And you guys, come on. We have a child here. We have a granddaughter here for you, a daughter for you, that didn't pick this unit. <laughs> they just got assigned to this unit. And you owe it to them to stop this tug of war. If you are behaving in an immature and impulsive way with your daughter, that needs to stop. This family needs help. This family needs an intervention. And I am willing to provide that if y'all are willing to participate in that and give you the help that you need. Will you participate in that? Do you need that help? Yes, I do. Do you need that help? Absolutely. Do you need that help? Most definitely. Okay, well, then we've got a plan. Thanks for being here today. So long. I'm going to get you some help with this, but you need to take it. Are you going to do it? I'm just not satisfied with today at all. Well, okay. Hold on a second. 
Hold on a second. I, I want to have this conversation. You say you're not satisfied with today at all. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you're not satisfied with. Because my whole point was is that everything that goes on with this family is beyond this Jack thing right now. That right. That my mom is controlling everything in my life or right. trying to. You want me to give examples? No, I, 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 I am stunned to hear what you are saying. I get the four issues that are going on here. The clear and present danger that needed to be assessed and evaluated in the interest of your daughter was what we focused on today. And the truth is, I didn't come here to satisfy you. I came here to protect your daughter. No, and... And if what you want to do is, and if what you want to do is have an attitude about it and no. a chip on your shoulder, no. then we can handle this differently. And no. I will just can report I, can this. I, please I will talk? just report all of this no, and this let let, let people can deal I, with it. Can I please talk? No, what oh, it's I mean not is, fair. What no, is not fair? The parent, like I'm constantly being parented on how I'm supposed to parent. Everything is very difficult for me. Well, you know how I look at this. I look at this like somebody calls and says the house is on fire, it's burning, and you answer the front door and said, I'd like to talk about fire prevention. <laughs> well, you know what? I don't want to talk about fire prevention until we get the fire out. When you get the fire out, then we can talk about fire prevention. You needed a clear assessment of what's going on here. And I didn't come in and give you a histrionic response. I gave you the facts here and informed you as a mother. And if you cared about your daughter, and I believe you do, I do. then you would be real interested in everything that took place here today instead of pouting that we didn't cover all of your agenda. Because your agenda about this mother here I went through an entire list of things that this woman is controlling about. I get it. I then acknowledged this. I criticized her for doing things such as manipulating a birthday party when you were at work and can't get there. I had an entire list of inventory I could go over with you as your bad behavior as a mother. I chose not to do that. I did deal with your sister because she's getting pushed out of the picture here when in fact she clearly has open wounds and feeling like she is a second class citizen in this family with her victimization. So we took time and talked about that. I'm glad you were here so we could do that. And then I said I will bring you a team of professionals to pick up the, uh, the, the, the task and move forward. And if you're not happy with that, sorry. So long.